In the high country of Central Oregon, on the east side of the Cascade Mountains, a high-priority double-stack train kicks up the snow as it races northward between Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon. For the moment, the train slices through a forest of lodgepole pine on a route originally run by the Southern Pacific. This is the Cascade Subdivision. In part one of this two-part series, we watched trains do battle with a 40-mile, 1.8% climb up the west side of the Cascades out of Oak Ridge. Now, in part two, we follow the line for 108 miles between Cascade Summit and Klamath Falls, located just north of the California border. With easy grades and gentle curves, this section of the Cascade subdivision is a racetrack with speeds of up to 60 for freight and 80 for passengers. Heavy manifest trains head south with lumber from the Pacific Northwest. Crude oil trains roll between Canada and Southern California. See double stacks. Grain trains. the Gilcrest local out of Klamath Falls, and Amtrak's Coast Starlight on its daily run up and down the West Coast. We'll even show you a Jordan spreader at work, pushing back the snow banks in between winter storms. BNSF inside gateway traffic adds to the interesting mix with trackage rights trains between Klamath Falls and Chamalt. We will get our first look at brand new Tier 4 Jeevos making their first revenue runs over the Cascade Line. As well as visitors from the Canadian Pacific. Amtrak Heritage Power. Shot over an eight-year period between 2008 and 2016, there is lots to see as we continue our trek through the Oregon Cascades. The Cascade subdivision runs 152.9 miles between Oak Ridge and Klamath Falls, Oregon. However, the territory for train crews extends another 44.4 miles to Eugene on UP's Brooklyn sub. Today, we will be traversing the east side of the Cascades beginning at Cascade Summit and heading to the southern end of the subdivision at Klamath Falls. After departing Cascade Summit, the railroad winds through the Deschutes National Forest in more or less a southerly course to Crescent Lake, then heads southeast through Malwich and Gilcrest Junction, where the Klamath Northern interchanges cars with the UP. The rails continue south to Chamalt. Here, the BNSF Oregon Trunk Subdivision joins the Cascade Line, and trains run via trackage rights to Klamath Falls. This is also an Amtrak stop with a northbound number 14 arriving mid-morning and southbound number 11 in the evening. Continuing nearly due south, the line passes through the sidings of Diamond Lake, Yamsey, Lenz, Fuego, and the former end of track at Kirk. Trains then drop down a 0.8% descending grade above the Williamson River Canyon through Calamus and reach the bottom of the grade at Chiloquin. From there, the railroad enters the scenic Klamath Basin, and it is again mostly level running through Modoc Point, and around Klamath Lake through Algoma, and Wokus, before finally reaching the crew change point at Klamath Falls.
we begin our journey high up in the Cascade Mountains of Central Oregon. The shores of Odell Lake cover more than 13 miles of the Deschutes National Forest in northwestern Klamath County. Located near the summit of Willamette Pass, the lake fills a basin carved by a glacier at an elevation of 4,787 feet. A lodge and resort are nestled along the western shore, and the former Southern Pacific Cascade subdivision is hidden behind that in the timber. A winter view of Odell Lake reveals a silhouette of Diamond Peak and Mount Yoran, which are prominent landmarks in the Oregon high country. A casual observer may not even realize that a mainline railroad cuts right through the countryside. This is due mostly to the dense forest land that covers most of the Oregon Cascades. Various species of fir, mixed stands of cedar, pine, and western hemlock dominate the region as we set up at Cascade Summit. A small bulldozer goes about the task of clearing snow from the right-of-way near the north switch during a break from winter storms. It is early February 2016, and the temperature at Cascade Summit is nearly 50 degrees, a great departure from the normal, which is around freezing. A meet is about to take place, and soon our first train of the day arrives. Amtrak 14, the northbound coast starlight appears on the main as it slowly approaches the north switch. It will have to wait momentarily for a southbound mixed manifest to take the siding. The train in question is having issues with one of its head-end locomotives and is taking longer than expected to reach the summit. Dispatcher 268 in Omaha, Nebraska considered changing the meet to Abernathy on the west side of the summit but decided it was better to keep the heavy train moving and not run the risk of stalling on the hill. Just as the Starlight comes to a stop on the main, the southbound finally makes it to Cascade Summit with two brand new GE ET44AH diesels on the point. This is train QPWRV. It originated on the Portland and Western Railroad in the Willamette Valley and is bound for Roseville, California. The third unit, an older C60-44AC, quit loading on the stiff 1.8% climb out of Oak Ridge. The 69-car train hauling mostly forest products will have little difficulty making the rest of the trip from here to Klamath Falls. Two more brand new Tier 4 locomotives, designated by UP as C45AHs, work in distributed power mode on the rear of the train. This is tunnel country, and as you can imagine, these units won't stay clean very long. With the train safely in the 7,687-foot siding, the dispatcher quickly aligns the north switch for the main, and Amtrak is soon back on its northbound journey between Los Angeles and Seattle.
An old wooden snow gauge is located near the north switch of Cascade Summit. This winter, storms have left about five feet on the ground, although it is not unusual to see much more here. Prevailing westerly winds off the Pacific Ocean bring substantial precipitation to the area, and in the winter, that means snow. About 20 minutes after Amtrak, a northbound stack train led by UP-5414 rolls over Cascade Summit and slows for the 40-mile 1.8% descending grade to Oak Ridge, which is covered in Part 1. The engineer blows for maintenance of way personnel parked near the siding, as well as our camera crew. As the stack train continues down the hill, let's turn south along the Cascade subdivision. Crescent Lake is located near milepost 529. This was once a division point and crew change point on the Southern Pacific. The depot and clubhouse where crews stayed is long gone. However, a water tank from the steam era still remains, as well as a Y-track, a 9,575-foot siding and a few maintenance of way buildings. The water tenders in the distance are stored for use in fighting wildfires during the summer months. If you look carefully, a fire lookout tower is also visible above the forested peak of Odell Butte. Originally built in 1916, it is still staffed every summer. Set up just north of the Y, UP 8080 North leads a manifest through Crescent Lake on the 60 mile per hour track. As we continue south along the Cascade subdivision, we see the large stands of fir have given way to a dense forest of lodgepole pine, also known as jack pine. With a dusting of snow on the ground, UP 8256 South leads train QHKRV through Mowich. The engineer gives us a friendly whistle as a train passes by.
The two radio-controlled GVOs throttle up as they pass the signals at the south switch of Mowich. This was a location of a full signal bridge from the Southern Pacific era, and it made a nice frame for southbound trains with snow-covered Diamond Peak as a backdrop. UP 7702 South heads through Mowich in May of 2012. As the rear of the train disappears from view, the head end is rolling through Gilcrest Junction, milepost 513.2. Gilcrest Junction is a connection with a 10.6 mile long Klamath Northern Main Line, which serves a sawmill in Gilcrest, currently owned by Canadian company Interfer. The line was constructed in 1938 by the Gilcrest Timber Company and has been operated by the Klamath Northern Railway Company since 1940. The sole engine on the KNOR roster is number 207, a GE SL144 built in 1982. The 207 is a 125 ton center cab diesel electric switcher that is rated at over 1,000 horsepower. It uses a pair of Cummins diesel engines, one for each truck, and has a starting tractive effort of 86,400 pounds. The 207 has just spotted 10 lumber loads and will take these empty center beams back to the mill at Gilcrest.
From the other side of the UP mainline, we watch as the Klamath Northern begins its return trip to Gilcrest. A UP local out of Klamath Falls makes the 84 and a half mile run to Gilcrest Junction a few days a week. It usually arrives in the late afternoon. The crew of the Gilcrest local take down the derail, which protects the main line as a snowstorm blows in. The train is usually powered by a pair of EMD SD70 amps. UP 4693 and 4092 are coupled together at the B end so they can run around their train and head back to Klamath Falls since there is no turning facility here. It also makes switching operations a lot faster. The local is usually made up of around a dozen cars consisting of center beams and or wood chip gondolas. It brings empties and returns south with loads. The conductor removes the Fred from the last wood chip car and walks toward the power. The local brought seven chip guns and will be leaving two for the KNOR. The remaining five cars today will be returning south to Klamath Falls, along with a cut of ten loaded center beams spotted to the right. This junction is out in the middle of the Deschutes National Forest and far from any infrastructure. The sodium lights make the job of switching a lot easier and safer at night than relying totally on handheld railroad lanterns. The lights are turned off after the train departs. After dropping the chip guns, the power runs around the lumber cars. The brakeman aligns the switch and the power backs down the far track to tie on to the remaining five wood chip cars. They will be placed on the front of the lumber loads and taken back south.
With the train together and air test complete, the Gilcrest local heads back south to Klamath Falls. Continuing south on the Cascade subdivision, we pass through the small community of Chamalt. With an elevation of 4,764 feet above sea level, Chamalt is known as one of the snowiest communities in the lower 48 states. Its 30-year average snowfall of 90.1 inches makes it comparable to Flagstaff, Arizona. This small mountain community also boasts some of the coldest nights in the U.S with an average of 255 nights falling below freezing each year. During the winter months, it's not too surprising to find the area around Chamalt is commonly used for snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, and dog sled racing. A signal bridge guarding the junction with the BNSF Oregon Trunk subdivision shows a red board as Amtrak 11, the southbound coast starlight, is lined down the main to the depot. It's 8.47 p.m. on the 31st day of May, 2012. The bugs illuminated in number 11's headlights are mosquitoes, which can be prevalent on warm spring nights. A small group of passengers line up to board the train. Chamalt is the only stop between Eugene and Klamath Falls. And though the community of 300 seems small for an Amtrak stop, many passengers from Bend a much larger town an hour's drive to the north also have Amtrak service and are shuttled by bus to meet the train here. Around 9,000 passengers pass through this facility each year. Five-minute stop, number 11 gets the highball and departs Chimalt. 11, LA and Black, here we go.
As the train rolls under the signal bridge, it may seem like it's passing a red signal. These signals govern the junction with the BNSF at control point VP503, while the south switch of Chamalt is another two-thirds of a mile beyond the bridge. Amtrak continues at restricted speed until the signal at CPVP502 comes into view. 11, on and clear. Here we go. On and clear, 11. The next morning, we are set up at the south end of the junction, opposite the relay hut for CPVP 503. It's the 1st of June and the mountain air is crisp and cold as a northbound UP MRVPT highballs through Chamalt on the main track. After the train passes, we stay at the junction for another northbound. BNSF has trackage rights over the UP from here to Klamath Falls. These trackage rights go back to the Great Northern Era. The classic SP searchlights show a red over lunar, indicating the UP dispatcher has a switch line for the Oregon trunk, and soon we see BNSF 5026 North slowly leading a bear table train up the siding to the junction. Returning to the summer of 2015, new signals guard the junction. A high yellow tells us a northbound is lined through the siding. CP 8749 leads train OCAAC, an empty crude oil train from Bakersfield, California, bound for interchange with the Canadian Pacific at Eastport, Idaho. Amtrak 14 is right on its heels as it takes a 9,266-foot siding to let it pass.
Crude oil trains began showing up on the Cascade subdivision in late 2014, but have never become a regularly scheduled movement due to the fluctuating price of crude. With the oil cans in the hole, the dispatcher quickly lines Amtrak up the main to the depot. In part one of this series, we showed you scenes from the 2008 Fraser Slide, which closed the Cascade Line for three months. During that time, UP was forced to reroute up to 15 trains per day. Here we catch the southbound ZBRLC coming off the BNSF's Oregon Trunk subdivision in February of 2008. Seeing this hot Z train slowly lumbering off the Oregon Trunk Line was definitely an unusual sight. A few years later, we caught it again on its normal route as it races over the south switch at 60 miles per hour. BNSF runs about six trains per day between Chamalt and Klamath Falls, adding to the frequency of traffic here. BNSF 7921 is in charge of train HBARPAS, a Barstow, California to Pasco, Washington manifest. It slowly approaches the south switch of Chamalt in January of 2016.
The train disappears in the siding as it heads up the Oregon trunk line to Bend and then on to the Columbia River at Wishram, Washington. A little while later, a northbound Z train kicks up the snow with UP 2605, a brand new Tier 4 GE on the point. On a snowy evening, BNSF 5384 South approaches a rural grade crossing near the north switch of Diamond Lake. A snow-covered Walker Mountain peers over the code lines near Diamond Lake. With mostly level running and little curvature, trains race through the forest of Lodgepole Pine on the east side of the Cascades, paralleling nearby Highway 97. Another heavy lumber train heads for Roseville.
The next sighting to the south is Yamsi, which breaks a tape measure at 6,150 feet. Yamsey was unique because it had a full signal bridge at each end. The vintage SP signals were soon to be replaced, and we shot these scenes in September of 2013. A year later, they would be gone, and most of the bridges and cantilevers would be taken down. UP 8094 South races through Yamsey, framed by the signal bridge at milepost 493. Right behind the UP, BNSF 4092 South approaches Yamsey with some interesting motive power in its consist, including a KCS SD70 ACE and a former Santa Fe SD40-2 still in its blue bonnet paint scheme. A CSX Jeevo and BNSF-9 add their horsepower to the rear of the train. We returned to the south end of Yamsey in the winter of 2016. The old signals and structures are gone, but like 2013, it is a busy day on the Cascade sub. UP 8072 South leads along ZBRLC past milepost 493 as another winter storm blows through the east side of the Cascades.
right on the heels of the Z. UP-8228 is in charge of a loaded grain train hauling chicken feed to California. It is symboled the GETMV-1. These heavy trains require eight engines, three on the point, four mid-train, and one on the rear. Continuing south, we go back to September of 2013 and the classic SP cantilever signal bridge at North Lens. A short northbound manifest led by UP-8615 passes on the main. A southbound BNSF pass bar was waiting at Chamalt for the northbound UP to get by. Around 30 minutes later, BNSF 7360 South races through Lens. The double stacks on this train are garbage containers bound for Klamath Falls. The Pasco to Barstow train picked them up in Wishram, Washington. A UP water tender is snowbound on a spur track at Lens, waiting for the next year's fire season when it may be needed. BNSF 6847 North passes with a friendly whistle and away from the crew.
New signals guard the south switch of lens as two brand new Tier 4s lead a northbound UP past the 6,162-foot siding. Winter clouds cast their dark shadows across the sky as we come to a break in the timber. The country to the east of the main line opens up briefly to reveal the Klamath Marsh. Although appearing dormant and empty during the winter months, it is good grazing land for cattle. There is also a 40,000 acre wildlife refuge here, which was established in the late 1950s. The January sun shines dimly through the clouds as Amtrak 14 races past the Klamath Marsh near milepost 481. Although it doesn't look like it, the train is approaching us at the maximum track speed of 80 miles per hour. The glow from a headlight and a green eye announced the approach of an early morning BNSF at Kirk, milepost 470.3. The sharp peak of Mount Thielson pokes above the lodgepole pine at Kirk. The Central Pacific originally built the rails between Chiliquin and here in 1912, and it remained the end of the line until 1924. This gap between Kirk and Oak Ridge became known as the Natron Cutoff. It took until 1926 before the Cascade Line was finally completed by the Southern Pacific. Ninety years later, UP 8090 South heads through Kirk without stopping on a cold winter's morning.
Quaking aspens add their splash of gold to the scene as the trees begin turning in mid-September. Trains slow to 35 miles per hour for the 0.8% descending grade above the Williamson River Canyon to Chiloquin. UP 8236 South rolls down grade just north of Calamus. Code lines still stand sentinel along most of the Cascade subdivision, even though in many places, new technology has made them obsolete. To us, they add to the personality of the railroad. Amtrak 14 rounds a curve near milepost 468. Moving to the outside of the curve, UP 5392 North chases Amtrak up the hill. Set up near the north switch of Calamus, BNSF 4382 South heads through a cut bank before passing the 7,161 foot siding.
This scene was shot in October of 2014. The new LED signals at North Calamus have just been installed and the old searchlights removed. The cantilever signal bridge was just days away from the cutter's torch as we caught this changing of the guard and the retirement of 1950s technology. Calamus marks the end of the territory for Dispatcher 68. For the rest of the way to Klamath Falls, train movements are handled by Dispatcher 66. Below Calamus, the Gilcrest local heads north with 14 empty chip guns. Train QHKRV slaloms down the 0.8% grade of Calamus Hill. A private car special rounds a curve at Old Corral Road, just north of Chiliquin. This 28-car train has four Amtrak Genesis units on the point. With some snow on the ground, another Amtrak train approaches the crossing. This time, it's number 14. With winter snows comes a need for snow removal. A Jordan spreader has been called out of Klamath Falls to do some work. This is the newly refurbished SPMW 8001 with a couple of GEs for power and a Pullman crew car. Since they are off to do some plowing, let's follow them north for a little while to show the spreader in action. As we mentioned before, the SPMW 8001 has recently been refurbished. Here's how it looked back in 2008 as it approaches the day school road crossing south of Chiliquin. Besides the paint job, pay attention to the cab and check out the SP Bay Window caboose on the rear of the train.
back to the chase, the newly refurbished 8001 is seen pushing the banks back at Kirk in between snowstorms. In the upgrade, a cab control stand was added so the engineer can operate the locomotives from the spreader, extra ditch lights were added to the cab for better visibility at night, spinning bad weather windows, and a new crew cabin was installed on the back, along with several other upgrades. As for the bay window caboose, we are sure the crew appreciates this former SP heavyweight car instead. Currently lettered SPMW 7118, this Pullman car was built in 1912 as a sleeper car named Clover Blossom. After a long career, it was reassigned to maintenance of way in 1959, and most recently given new life by the UP to be used in snow service with the spreader. Both units are based in Klamath Falls. Jumping ahead of the plow, we move to the south switch of Fuego, which is located between Kirk and Lenz. We again catch the spreader shoving the banks back along the right-of-way. The spreader takes the siding at Fuego, where a southbound BNSF is patiently waiting at the north switch. The dispatcher has trains to run, and the crew will have to wait for one each direction before resuming work. Though not as impressive to watch as the spreader, this propane-fired switch heater is also doing its job of keeping the switch points clear of snow and ice. BNSF 5422 South accelerates as it passes on the main.
After the second train, a northbound bear table passes, we move to the north end of Fuego and watch as the 8001 begins plowing the siding. On the first of two passes, the spreader shoves the snow from the siding onto the main track. Once this is done, the train makes a reverse move through the south switch and then will come up the main. On the final pass, the spreader shoves the snow off the main track. The right wing is extended as a counterbalance during this pass. Having frozen, thawed, and packed over several days, this snow resembles concrete. Heavy slabs weighing hundreds of pounds each rise and break off as the spreader slowly moves up the line. Dusk settles in as a spreader continues working north between Fuego and Lens. After plowing for most of the day, the spreader arrives at Lens just before the crew reaches their hours of service at 6 p.m. Here they will tie up for the night. A green signal is visible on the main at the north end of Lens. While the spreader sits in the siding, a northbound lights up the scene as it heads into the night.
Continuing our journey along the Cascade Sub, a UP officer's special rounds a curve just north of Chiloquin behind a lone SD70 ACE. Former Southern Pacific cars Stanford and Sunset, now wearing armor yellow, follow obediently behind. Near milepost 458 and a half, Amtrak 14 rounds the same curve as it heads up Calamus Hill. A private Chesapeake and Ohio car is tacked onto the rear of the train. The 8,929-foot peak of Mount Scott marks the eastern edge of Crater Lake and is easily seen at the north switch of Chiloquin, CPVP458. By the way, CP stands for Control Point. VP is Valley Point, since this line extends north from the Valley Sub out of Roseville. With all the different control points and mileposts throughout Union Pacific's vast CTC system, this code makes each control point unique and avoids any possible confusion. The train disappears around a curve as it begins its climb toward Kirk. Here is the same scene with a winter squall blowing in. It's December of 2014, and oil trains have just begun running on the Cascade Line. This is actually the fifth oil train to make the trip. A pair of refurbished EMD SD9043 ACs lead the 100-car unit train into Chiloquin in a meet with a northbound BNSF.
four mid-train remotes, looking like they have been through a few tunnels, assist as swing helpers. As the train slowly approaches the south switch, the lights of the northbound BNSF appear as it takes a siding. The rear buffer car appears and two more DPUs, including a Canadian Pacific AC4400, clear the north switch. The oil train continues south, and within a few minutes, BNSF 7038 gets a light to proceed out of the siding as the snow continues to fall. The trailing locomotive in this consist, BNSF 7695, is unique. It is the only engine on the railroad's roster given a yellow BNSF swoosh logo. Rail fans call it the gold bar unit. Just to the left of the train, you can see the crumpled remains of the cantilever signal bridge with the SP searchlight still attached. This structure was saved and now resides at the nearby Train Mountain Railroad Park, the largest hobby railroad in the world.
we have moved to the south end of Chiloquin. A vintage rotary snowplow and Jordan spreader sits on a spur track awaiting a move to nearby Train Mountain. The move was featured on an episode of the reality TV show Mega Movers. This rotary was based in Oak Ridge and was last used in 1989 on the Cascade Sub. It was moved to Chiloquin on September 11, 2001 and relocated to Train Mountain in November of 08. A few of its sisters are still stored in Roseville, California and see occasional use on fabled Donner Pass. A northbound pass is this classic piece of maintenance of way equipment. Fast forwarding to New Year's Eve of 2015, UP 8787 North leads a Z train through Chiloquin with a former Southern Pacific AC 4400 lettered UP 6311 and UP 5768. The skies are a clear blue and the temperature is 7 degrees above zero. The Z train met a southbound at Calamus which now rolls past the grain elevator that is a prominent feature in town. The crew on this train was running short on hours and weren't sure they would be able to make it to Klamath Falls before going dead on the law. We will see if they made it later on. In the meantime, let's transition to an amber fall morning at Amtrak's northbound coast starlight at Chiloquin. Chiloquin is a maintenance base for UP, and this freshly painted building is located near the main crossing in town. On a different day, Amtrak Heritage Unit number 66 passes the same location. The Gilcrest local heads north at Lobert.
More fall colors set the scene for number 14. The Cascade Mountains are the dividing line between the moist climate of western Oregon and the semi-arid eastern part of the state. After passing through Chiloquin, the railroad enters the Upper Klamath Basin, which sits at an elevation of just over 4,000 feet. High mountain lakes fill with runoff from winter snowmelt, providing water for agriculture and recreation. It is also a haven for waterfowl and birds of prey. Just above Upper Klamath Lake near Modoc Point, a northbound BNSF bear table train heads into the night. Summertime thunderstorms and nearby wildfires bring the sky alive with colors that are always changing. On a different day, the southbound Gilcrest Local approaches a north switch at Modoc Point with Mount Scott for a backdrop. Dissolving from June to January, the northbound Gilcrest local rolls over the north switch and races past our location on the 60 mile per hour track. Right behind the local, a northbound BNSF manifest takes the same route as the afternoon sun tries to break through the clouds.
BNSF 4547 South heads through Modoc Point on a mid-morning run to Klamath Falls. A rebuilt SD9043AC and an SD60 have made it into the locomotive consist on this northbound. Where we are standing was once the site of the Lamb Lumber Company sawmill, which is long gone. This scaling shack is one of the few buildings that remain on the site. Logging was once big business here, and the local economy thrived. The Gilcrest Local races along the shore of Klamath Lake in the late afternoon. From our location, we are able to follow the train as it rolls between Modoc Point and Algoma. Trains enjoy mostly level running for the remainder of the trip to Klamath Falls. The Cascade Line traverses the eastern shore of Klamath Lake, giving both train crews and passengers a fantastic view even when visibility is reduced thanks to smoke from wildfires. Amtrak 14 heads north near milepost 443. Klamath Lake is the largest freshwater lake in Oregon, with a length of 25 miles and a width of 8 miles at its widest point. Yet it is deceptively shallow, averaging between 8 and 50 feet deep. This is the last day of July 2015. A blood-red sun heads for a hiding place behind Pelican Butte on the west side of the lake. Several forest fires in the southern Cascade Range have flared up, mostly started by lightning although a few were man-made. The smoke gives us some interesting light as a northbound BNSF rolls through the shadows. As the train disappears, we gaze across the lake in the fading light.
The moon rises over a ridge as another day of rail fanning comes to a close. During the winter months, the shallow lake often freezes for weeks at a time, giving hard water a whole new meaning. Mount McLaughlin looks majestic in the early morning, rising above the west side of the lake. And California's Mount Shasta comes into view, standing over 14,000 feet above sea level. We are perched on the steep slope above the east side of the lake, and a pale winter sun looks down on the frozen world. While taking in the view, we are interrupted by the melodious sound of a trio of two-stroke EMDs on the point of a southbound manifest as it sprints along the edge of the frozen lake. GE C45AC CTE takes care of the rear of the train. Flipping a few more pages in the calendar to August, we hike once more along the ridge above the lake. The water is again fluid, showing off a deep blue green, and a warm summer breeze blows across the land. From our vantage point, we can see how the railroad parallels Highway 97. The Gilcrest local heads south with seven lumber loads and nine chips. During the early 20th century, when the timber industry was strong, over a million and a half board feet of lumber traveled these rails to Klamath Falls from Chiliquin each day. UP detector, milepost 442.6. UP detector. After getting a good report from the detector, the local stretches out across a tangent track between the lake and irrigated farmland. Many of us are drawn to trains because of their great size and the awesome power of locomotives. But when we step back and observe them moving through the vastness of their surroundings, we may find that what's big and awesome is more than what sits on the rails. Moving in for a lower angle, a northbound BNSF loaded dump train rolls through the high speed curve near Hagelstein Park. Dump trains use a conveyor belt system to place ballast right where it is needed at up to 2,000 tons per hour.
Algoma is the next sighting to the south. Another BNSF heads for Klamath Falls on a cool winter's day. A Laram rail grinder heads through Algoma. With a light dusting of snow on the ballast, Amtrak 14 sprints north between Wokus and Algoma. We return to the stretch of track between Algoma and Wokus six months later. The temperature is about 60 degrees warmer, and the rabbit brush is in bloom on this late August morning. We get one last look at our northbound empty oil train with the Canadian Pacific power on the point. With smoke from nearby forest fires lingering in the air, the train passes the intermediate signal on a clear block. This train had greens all the way to Chamalt where, as we saw earlier, it paused for Amtrak to pass. It's December 31st. The midday sun hangs far to the south as the Z train with the SP unit heads past the 6,241 foot siding at Wokus. Wokus is the last siding north of Klamath Falls.
Klamath Falls was founded in 1867 as Linkville, named after a nearby river. The name was changed to Klamath Falls in 1892. The community thrived with the coming of the railroad in 1909. Lumber mills flourished, providing much-needed materials for a growing nation. Today, the mills are mostly gone. However, agriculture still plays a key role in the economy. An old wigwam still stands at a former mill site along Lake Awana. To the south, a BNSF local sporting former Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Power heads for a Weyerhaeuser mill located downstream across the Klamath River. The train crosses the Klamath River on a long bridge that includes a draw which is permanently set in the down position. While the BNSF crosses the river, a UP local takes care of some switching duties at the south end of Klamath Falls Yard. Zooming in to the north end, a work train gets underway and we can make out the Jordan spreader and refurbished Pullman car we saw working earlier. The power ducks under the signal bridge at the north end of the yard as the work train departs. These scenes were shot from Kago Hill, owned by local radio stations just west of downtown. Klamath Falls Yard is milepost 428.7 on the Cascade Sub and is the division point between the Portland and Roseville divisions, as well as a crew change point. Engineers on the Cascade Sub, known as the Hill Pool, are based in Eugene, while conductors call Klamath Falls their home terminal. UP 2615 North waits for a light out of Klamath Falls after another northbound, an MRVEU, finishes making up their train. The long cut of cars are shoved into 7-track to clear up so the 2615 can get underway. With the switch lined for the main, UP 2615 North has permission to depart Klamath Falls Yard.
2615 is another brand new Tier 4 GE, and in the locomotive consist are six more, making their first trip over the Cascade Sub. The newest version of the Evolution series, GE designates this model as an ET44AH, while UP calls it a C45AH. The most notable difference is the extra-large radiator with a two-split fan cooling system, two extra air intakes, and a hump around the exhaust stack, which houses the exhaust treatment system. These units are 74 feet 6 inches long, 16 inches longer than any other GE six-axle unit going back to the Dash 9. We enjoy seeing these brand new units in fresh paint, for they won't stay clean very long. Earlier, we caught a southbound at Chiloquin with a short-time crew who weren't sure they could make it to Klamath Falls before reaching their hours of service. Well, here they are, entering the yard with just minutes to spare. It is New Year's Eve, and this was the last train we taped in 2015. The DPUs come to a stop in front of us, and the outbound crew comes over to take the locomotives off the rear of the train before continuing south to Dunsmuir on the Black Butte sub. But that's a story for another time. Mount Shasta glows in the cool evening light as we reach the end of our journey. Ice again starts to form over Klamath Lake, and the headlight of a northbound can be seen as it begins its nighttime run to Eugene. We hope you've enjoyed your tour of this scenic line that seldom is visited by rail fans, where trains run through the Oregon Cascades. As always, thanks for watching.